just as the commodity cycle is peaking, I'm sitting down at lunch with another hedge, a young hedge fund in, uh, uh, manager who also is invested in Constellation Copper and we're talking through the dynamics of it. And he turns to me and he says, you know, Mike, I think you might be the smartest person in this industry. And I literally went back to my desk, wrote a note to the management team and I said, get me out of my positions. I want to liquidate my funds because if I'm the smartest person, right? If I, I and I have no idea what's really going on right now, everything seems to be going wrong. We're all, I think the technical term is screwed. Get me out. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another edition of My Life in Four Trades. Joining me today is Mike Green, Chief Strategist at Simplify Asset Management. Enjoy the conversation. Hi, Mike. Welcome to My Life in Four Trades. Oh, thank you, Maggie. I appreciate the invite. So before we jump in, tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and what were the early years like? Uh, so, <laughs> so I actually grew up on a farm in Northern California, about 35 miles away from where I am right now. Um, this is a return trip to California. I've moved back here twice. Um, let's see. Uh, growing up in Northern California, I ended up going east to go to college at the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business for undergrad. Uh, left Wharton to go into uh, go into consulting initially working for a firm called Bain and Company, and then left Bain with a couple of senior guys to start a firm called the Parthenon Group. Um, and I've kind of continued that somewhat smaller firm entrepreneurial path throughout my career. In 1996, I left consulting to co-found a software company called Value Add Software. That was in turn sold to a firm called Holt. Uh, Holt was in turn sold to Credit Suisse. And at that point, I made the transition over to the asset management space. In asset management, I started out in small cap value. So I was a single stock picker working for a firm called, firm called Moody Aldrich Partners. Uh, good performance there led to me being recruited to run mutual funds for a firm called Royce and Associates, which was the largest small cap specialist down in New York. And from there, I was then recruited by the team out of Canyon Partners to launch their New York office in 2006 ran that um, between 2006 to 2014, um, building it from initially a small allocation to a team of approximately 15 people running about $5 billion in AUM, and uh, was then pulled out of Canyon Partners by the opportunity to launch my own firm, a firm called Ice Farm Capital that was seeded by the Soros Fa Foundation. Uh, that ultimately ended up being one of the more interesting experiences in my life. Uh, we could certainly talk about that. It was not a trade per se, but but more of a uh, uh, a life learning experience. Um, and when I ended up shutting that down in late 2015, beginning part of 2016, I then transitioned to managing Peter Thiel's capital for a period of time. And uh, post Peter Thiel, very briefly at a firm called Logica, and then joined Simplify in uh, 2021 to help launch and develop out the products that, that they had created around offering derivative overlays into traditional uh, beta exposures in the ETF space. So you were sort of firmly on this on this finance path. You went to Wharton. Did you always know you wanted to get involved in investing? I mean, did sort of money and investing play an important role in your family when you were young? No, not at all, actually. Um, I grew up in an environment in which, uh, for the most part, it wasn't talked about all that much. I became very interested at a relatively young age. So around 14, 15, I started actively following the stock market. I've what told possesses the story before. A, a 14 or 15 year old to sort of like yeah, whip open be, the being yeah. Being very into math, right? Uh. That's like, that's always the easiest thing, right? It's the most readily available numbers for you. And so you immediately gravitate to it. You know, had the interesting experience of convincing, you know, reading enough stuff that uh, stumbled across some of the things that were being written heading into the crash in 87, managed to convince my parents to, you know, move to cash in their portfolios. And so when the crash of 87 was happening, I actually faked being sick so that I could stay home in California and watch the stock market implode. Um, and from that point, I was pretty much hooked, you know, from the, the soon after that or, or right around that time, you know, uh, 
uh, Charlie Sheen manages to score Daryl Hannah in the movie Wall Street, and I'm like, that's what I want to do. So, um, <laughs> and your parents as did are many like, in my generation, and your parents are like, thank goodness for him. Uh, somebody knows what they're doing. You sound like the sort of Michael J. Fox character in that in that '80s sitcom where he t- tossed some Northern California drugs into it, and yes, he probably <laughs> got that aspect to it. So I want to, uh, I, I know this will all thread through, but I, I want to kick off and get to your first trade. Uh, and that is one of your best trades, and that's buying home builders in 1999. So sort of set the scene for us. Where are you at this point in your career? And, and how did this trade even get on your radar? So this was one of the first trades that I did for a firm called Moody Alders Partners, which is a small cap firm based up in the Boston area. And it's it's difficult to put in context, what was actually going on at that time, right? So we were seeing the dot-com bubble rage in its full glory. The NASDAQ was up, I believe, 86% in 1999. Small cap value was up like nine, right? Um, (laughs) Or maybe actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I think the index was flat and I was up like nine or something like that, right? It was just one of these ridiculous scenarios where um, it's not that you were doing badly per se. It's just you felt like a moron compared to, you know, the peers across the street at Putnam. Um, what we saw at that point in time was is that home builders were trading below book value. They were trading at a valuation that reflected impending distress. We had seen the yield curve invert earlier in 1999, heading into 2000, typically a predictor of recession. We were seeing tremendous amounts of pressure on industrial cyclicals on home builders, et cetera, bought them in the fourth quarter of 1999. And what we thought was, you know, a really attractive valuation of, you know, give or take 0.8 times book value, only to see them fall another 35 to 40%, right, over the next couple of months. And as we went into February of 2000, you know, I'm looking at my portfolio and thinking, my God, I've got such an attractive portfolio from a valuation standpoint, and nobody cares. Um, some people who follow me online or who have seen my original interview on Real Vision with Grant Williams, you know, would know that uh, just about that time, that was actually the genesis of me being labeled by one of my clients, the dumbest man alive, right? <laughs> and um, That's going you know, to so feel was, good. <laughs> oh, it was, it, it, in, in, I've kept it and, and held that because it was such a wonderful experience. And the guy who, who called me that ended up going to jail, right? Um, <laughs> So, you know, in, in, in every respect, it checks all the boxes of things that you want to remember in your career. Yeah. But it was in that environment as we went into February of 2000, where I was demonstrating to people, look, you know, we're pricing in a very deep recession that would be the equivalent of, at minimum, the type of recession that we saw in the housing market in, you know, the the um, uh, early 1990s, which is kind of the first drawdown when the baby boomers began to move out of condos and into single family homes, you saw a tremendous retreat, uh, retreat, not retweet, mm-hmm. um, in the housing market, particularly for condos in inner city, you know, in urban environments like Boston, New York, et cetera. Um, this was looking at something very similar in the single family market. We thought that was highly improbable. In fact, as we looked at the dynamics of of housing, we saw relative shortages and predicted that you would see increased concentration into home builders, et cetera. Now, the thesis ended up being 100% correct, but it also led to me being lambasted for you know being old economy and not mm. understanding the new economy. And nobody was going to need houses because they would just be able to inhabit the virtual space, right? Um Obviously, that didn't end up being true, but it was it, it was awesome to experience as you went through it. So, when, how did you respond when the the client says that that you're the dumbest man alive? Do you have any doubt? Like, is there a moment where you think, God, maybe he's right? Oh, 100 percent. Like, I mean, how can you not? I was 29 years old. He was 50 plus. Right. And so there's a combination like, you know, again, anyone who's listened to me long enough knows that you know, uh, intellectual humility is not my, sh- my strong suit. Right. So like, <laughs> you know, I definitely an element of like, uh, I don't really think it's possible that I'm the dumbest man alive, but it is always very useful when somebody tells you that, mm. right. For two reasons. One is it actually tells you that you're definitely saying something that is contrarian. And the second component is, is that as long as you've really thought through the analysis and are comfortable with it, 
that's just really good, right? Mm. It tells you that somebody else is being really dismissive. Um, yeah. And the, the exact line was, you know, given his age, right, the fact that I was 29 years old and didn't get the new economy, um, didn't understand why Cisco was worth, you know, 100 times earnings, et cetera. Uh, you know, that was really the underlying dynamic of why I was labeled the dumbest man alive. So it, it, when you're in a situation like that and, you've, you know, you feel that you've done the fu fundamental work and that your logic is there, you know, there will be people who say, listen, sometimes you're right, but your timing is off. Yeah. Did you... Why not? What what made you stay in the trade? Why not just cut your losses and get out, even if you thought your your logic was right? Yeah. So on a, on a fundamental basis, the question is: Has anything changed? Right? Does it, does the fact that we drew down thirty percent change any of our analysis, or does it simply raise the valuation component to it? Right? We were not seeing any signs of meaningful deterioration in the housing market at that point in time, and our our belief and understanding of the situation was unaffected, right? If, if anything, it made me add to my positions. But, mm. and this is the important but, when you get fired, you have to sell, right? And that's mm. really what was going on. That's why, despite the fact that the fundamentals were very clear, you were seeing the pressure because individuals like myself and my firm were getting fired by investors, causing us to sell home builders, the money was going into technology funds. The technology funds have no interest in home builders because it's, you know, the new economy, right? Mm. Um, so that was one of my first exposures to the dynamics of flow and the fact that, you know, money that comes into markets is influencing prices. Money going out of markets is influencing prices. It's not just as easy as saying, well, theoretically, I've done the calculation on this valuation. You have to figure out who's going to ultimately be the buyer. Mm. Now, the great irony is, is that we saw exactly that buyer almost exactly a month later when the NASDAQ crashed. And right, so this is one of the stories that I tell people all the time about how I, un, you know, the ways I started to develop an understanding of what actually transpired with the NASDAQ crash was I'm sitting at my Bloomberg, and this is, you know, March 10th, 2000, and the NASDAQ is falling, right? On an intraday basis, it's down about 7.5%. And meanwhile, my portfolio is up 6.5%, right? It was just a massive intraday reversal of, you know, give or take 1,300 basis points, almost 1,400 basis points of spread that was happening as people decided, okay, we're overweight the technology name, let's try to sell those. And let's put some money back in as we're supposed to do as we dollar cost average back into some of the small cap value funds, et cetera. We actually saw some of those flows. We actually had clients who said, okay, we're going to do, you know, we're rebalancing our portfolio. Can you put X to work for us? We're watching this chaos develop. And it was very clear to me that what we were watching was not a fundamental reappraisal of the NASDAQ story. What we were watching was simply a function of fiduciary responsibility saying after three years of holding this trade, we're now massively overweight this stuff. Mm. We have to reverse it. Let's follow our guidelines, et cetera. And that sort of behavior was much more common back then, right? You typically hire a manager, you'd give them three years as long as they didn't do anything that was completely off, you know, off kilter. Um, you would basically let the money sit with them that spring, right, so basically February of 2020, as I was going into the bake-off and being told, you know, the client review and being told I'm the dumbest man alive, everybody's making reallocation choices. Mm. All the investment company meetings are going on. And so everybody is roughly deciding almost exactly the same time, let's sell some of this stuff. So there's a rush to the exit. There was, a, there was very clearly a rush out of the NASDAQ and into things like small cap value. And mm -hmm. it's, this is one of the great exercises people can do is to actually go back and look at that period. And what you see is during the entire dot-com collapse, small cap value as an index is rising, I believe, something like 100% over that time period, mm -hmm. right? And it was the other, th the other experience that was so fascinating about it was at every step in that process, as we outperformed, we had redemptions because the firm had underperformed. The reason I was brought in was to try to help performance. The firm had underperformed as we recover. Our clients are like, okay, 
you know, it's been great. We really enjoyed getting to know you. We think you're on to a fantastic new direction. That kid, Mike Green, is probably not the dumb, dumbest man alive. In fact, he's kind of enjoyable and smart. But, you know, we're going to move on and we're going to make sure that we rebalance. And now you guys have significantly outperformed the NASDAQ. So we're going to take money away from you and put it back into the NASDAQ. Mm. Right. And that just happened over and over and over again. So what did you when it comes to this home builders experience, what do you what do you think you learned from that from that trade? So I think there's a couple of things that are always important. And, you know, those who follow me on Twitter will notice that I'm highlighting, you know, the alligator jaws that are effectively developing between oil stocks or energy stocks and the actual price of the underlying Um You know, when you see those divergences, whether it's the NASDAQ pricing in an economy that is going to be on fire and home builders pricing in an economy in which nobody buys a new home, you know, figuring out what's driving each of those two components and do you expect those to to, um, compress is a critical part of the investment process, right? Uh, Developing an understanding of the business models to get a sense for Am I looking at something that is um, cyclical and cheap because we're at the top of the market as compared to something that actually has the potential to meaningfully change in its construction? And the thing that people tend to forget about home building is certainly prior to the GFC and really even before that, it was a business that was largely built around small speculative home builders, right? A local general contractor would basically buy a plot of land or a series a, a um, you know farm and effectively start the process of breaking it up. Post GFC, that changed dramatically. But going into that, you had that sort of characteristic. The home builders market share, um, public home builders market share. When I started investing, I want to say it was around 18, 19 percent of the total home building market. Today, I want to say it's close to fifty. Mm. All right. So this has been there was huge share gain associated with that as well. But that was part of our thesis. And it really was just a function of continually updating it and monitoring it and making sure that the actual thesis was was underpinned by factual developments. But none of it really matters. Like, I, I just want to emphasize this. None of it matters relative to the flows. Yeah. Right. It's when people began putting money back into small cap value. It's when people began recognizing that maybe the you know old economy, new economy designation was not as valid as they had thought it was that the trade began to work and not before that. So your second trade you mentioned, let's talk about Constellation Copper um, and your your focus on the commodities. So you put this on after you're sort of moving away from the home builders is it, you, you've sort of, they overlap, but you get interested in the commodity space. So what what brought your you to Constellation Copper in particular in 2006? Constellation Copper was a, a relatively new startup copper company that had a development a development mine um, in process that was about to open in Colorado. All right. Um, the idea there was very straightforward. I was already participating in commodities through companies like Phelps Dodge, uh, which became uh, Freeport, et cetera, um, and was very much in the view that we were seeing this incredible growth in uh, raw materials demand being driven by China that had really started to kick in uh, around 2001. And it was basically a payback after an extended bear market that had just exploded in 1997, right? So the Asian financial crisis ended a lot of the development that had been going crazy in, uh, the, in the developing markets. The admission of China into most favored nation status, uh, radically changed that and basically sent emerging markets back into it, you know, into a growth mode. China was structurally short copper. It didn't have the reserves that you had historically, that you would have historically associated with it. And they basically had a business model that required them to import a whole bunch of copper and then export it to sell, you know, various manufactured goods into the United States, as well as build up their infrastructure, particularly the electricity components of things like the Three Gorges Dam, right? So the demand for raw materials in particular coming out of China was just off the charts. The general view was that commodity cycles took typically something like 14 years and that you needed something, you know, you needed something like six new major mines built over that time period. 
we really hadn't seen anything approaching that type of development. And Constellation Copper was a name that I encountered when I was still at Royce on the small cap side, um, took a small equity position and had seen it appreciate as it began to move from uh, you know, pre-permitting into feasibility studies, et cetera, right? Moving over to Canyon Partners, it was actually a really interesting opportunity because Constellation was in the final stages of its development, needed additional capital. Canyon Partners was known primarily for its work in fixed income. And I was able to structure a deal with Constellation into a convertible preferred that gave me additional security against the property and allowed me to create a, um, uh, a fixed income security, which Canyon felt more comfortable with, right? They did not have a long history of investing in commodities at that point, et cetera. And so this was an interesting opportunity. Now, the reason I highlight this trade is because it was a total wipeout. And the reason it was a total wipeout, every component of it, quote unquote, checked the boxes. I went and I saw the facility, I met the management team, everything seemed to be going great. There was a challenge that they were having in terms of their recoveries out of the um, uh, leaching process. But, you know, that was something that could easily be solved in their analysis by simply increasing the amount of acid that they were using. And the, you know, because when you leach copper out, you're effectively uh, pouring uh, acid on top of the copper itself. It's then creating a oxide that is, you know, coming out as this green liquid that you then separate through what's called an electro winning technology. Effectively, you're, you're um, putting an electrical plate into a pool of water and it attracts the copper ion to create copper, um, refined copper. So they were experiencing some challenges, but the, the management team had a plan for it and how they were going to handle it. It had been blessed by the feasibility study. And as they began to crank up the acid application, right, and we've got this debt security, things are looking great. As they begin to crank up the acid, we're not seeing the recoveries increase. And I'm like, you know, well, what's going on? They're, you know, well, you know, here's the cost, the, here's the way we, we model the system and, and we're getting less recoveries than we thought here. And what I discovered was that they had made a math, you know, basically a chemistry mistake, mm. right? Um, they were refiltering the solution back through thinking that every time they refiltered the solution that you would percolate basically the same percentage. But as they filtered it through, what they were actually doing, what I didn't fully realize, and this is again my failure as an investor, was that because this was a talc-rich uh, soil, it was effectively neutralizing the acid when mm. it came into contact with it. So it's a very right? localized situation. It was really. a super localized, very <laughs> specialized situation in which I candidly just made a terrible mistake, right? Mm. And then I discovered why it's an even more terrible mistake because we're going into the global financial crisis. As we're going into the global financial crisis, all of my thoughts around shortages in the commodities are playing out as China continues to stimulate into the Summer Olympics. The price of hydrochloric acid begins to skyrocket, and we rapidly discover that this is just a complete wipeout with no ready buyer of our underlying interest, mm -hmm. right? Fantastic illustration of the idiosyncratic mistakes that you can make as a small cap, small cap investor. And that's particularly true you know, when you enter into something like a financial crisis, there's just no buyer to, there's no greater yeah. fool to take the pieces off your hand. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and in that case, timing, the timing couldn't be worse. Hi, I'm Raoul Pal, the CEO and co-founder of Real Vision. The financial world is a complicated world right now. It's a really complicated macro picture and there's a lot of risks. Real Vision and our YouTube channel help you navigate those risks. So subscribe now to the channel and never miss an update. There is simply too much going on. So subscribe now. Thank you. How do right. you, I mean, you know, and this is happening when you are at this point an experienced small cap, you know, investor. This is kind of an, your an area. Experience, yeah, this is my area, right? I'm an experienced small cap investor. This is why I refer to it as somewhat of a bookend because in June of 2008, right, just as the commodity cycle is peaking, I'm sitting down at lunch with another hedge, a young hedge fund in, uh, uh, manager 
who also is invested in Constellation Copper, and we're talking through the dynamics of it. And he turns to me and he says, you know, Mike, I think you might be the smartest person in this industry. And I literally went back to my desk, wrote a note to the management team, and I said, get me out of my positions. I want to liquidate my funds. Because if I'm the smartest person, right, if I, I, and I have no idea what's really going on right now, everything seems to be going wrong, mm. we're all, I think the technical term is screwed, get me out. Wow. Right? Is that hard to do? Is that hard to make that, that decision? It was among the most liberating experiences of my career, right? Because it took me largely out of risk at that point, dramatically reduced my exposures. Now, because Canyon was a fixed income shop, they asked me to continue to run a you know, portion of the commodity book. And that, that commodity book, you know, I proceeded to lose 50%, had the worst experience of my career at that point. Um, or, or ever in my career, actually, um, from that point. But it was an incredibly liberating experience to say, I don't know what's going on. Mm. Get me out. Mm. So how do you recover? Because you've been you've been successful and you had a couple of, I mean, nailing the timing on housing and seeing the beginning of the China commodity boom. Those are big calls. I mean, those are career making calls in and of themselves. How do you reconcile now having this kind of terrible performance? Well, I mean, that that part was actually really straightforward, right? If you're going to manage a commodity book against inflation and deflation occurs, you, you would expect that you're going to have really terrible performance, right? Um, mine was no worse than anyone else's. And for that matter, the vast majority of people who were focused in commodity books from that point in time had similar drawdowns. The more interesting thing that actually came out of that was the way it impacted the firm and the choices that were then forced on you, mm -hmm. right? So I had taken down my book from basically $750 million to about $150 million on that $150 million took losses. And then in the post TARP environment, went back to the management team and said, okay, you know, now I've seen what I needed to see. I'd like to start investing, right? So I'm just to put this in context, I'm now down from 750 million voluntarily giving back 600 of it. I've taken the 150 down to 75, right? And the next conversation I have is, I want to take that back up, being greeted with, well, you know that money we took from you? We lost it all. Yeah. And by the way, you're the only um, investor in the, you're, you're the only portfolio manager on the team who remains liquid. So we need to actually take more money away from you in order to pay redemptions mm. um, or maintain margins, right? So I went from managing $750 million at the start of 2008 to by the end of 2008, I was running $27 million. That's barely in right? business in, in, the, in barely, the fund world. As, as, as in the fund world, that is barely, barely in business. Um, now, the great part about it is, is that that then in turn liberated me to say, OK, well, if I'm only going to be running 27 million bucks, I need to figure out you know, how to do pretty well with that. Um, and that actually pushed me into a lot of the derivative trades that then characterized my portfolio for the next five years or so and was extremely fortunate with the performance that you know, managed to take that 27 million and return almost 400 percent on it in 2009. Um, which made that into you know the best year I ever had, but any number of people had that, right? The real story in 2009 was simply surviving. Yeah. Right? If you got to that point yeah. and you weren't dumb enough to stay, you know, massively short, it, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. But to get to that point, just mentally, I mean, you know, I think that we're you can see the sort of ghosts of the great financial crisis around. I mean, you see it in people's behavior and and decisions they make, but it's easy to sort of smooth over it now. But there are many people that left the business. They just, it was so hard and people saw their whole career deteriorate. How do you say, okay, I'm barely hanging on, but I'm going to, I'm going to go tackle this other part of the market that I haven't really played in yet. Like we're, what made you think, you're a smart guy, why not just say, you know what, this is crazy, I'm out, I'm going to go do something else? 
Uh, well, I thought that choice might have been made for me, right? And I'll, I'll be honest <laughs> with you, they, they candidly, um, that's what happened to the vast majority of people. I was very fortunate. You know, the Canyon Partners made it through and, and largely remained intact. And in the context of the performance of Canyon Partners, you know, I actually did well, right? Um, it says a lot about the market experience that people went through, but I, I don't think people often fully appreciate like just how close we came to financial Armageddon there. Um, the second leg down, the leg down that happened in March where the equity markets are making new lows, that was actually like, that was so much easier because that was very clear. That was a replay of kind of the March 2000 experience with the liquidations, et cetera, mm -hmm. we actually experienced it. Like at Canyon Partners, you know, the marching orders basically came out in, you know, on January 1st. We expect to get a lot of redemptions, find as much cash as you can in the portfolio so that you can, fit, you know, sell what you can't hold on to so that you can, we can meet these redemptions that we anticipated. As you came into February, they didn't materialize. Mm. In fact, we saw inflows. Why is that, right? you think? I, the quick answer is I don't know, but I but ultimately I would suggest that the continued growth of assets in the institutional space and in general, the fact that the economy had created conditions under which there continued to be inflows, particularly on the back of significant fiscal support coming mm. from the government, created conditions under which people decided, you know what, let's try to wait this out. We're gonna we're gonna try to avoid liquidating at the wrong time. Mm. The fourth quarter of twenty of two thousand and eight, we saw a lot of the opposite behavior, right? So, you know, in the private equity space, for example, we saw Harvard have to sell secondary interests in their private equity funds at eight cents on the dollar, right? Now, just to you no, know, just stop and think about what that actually means. You're still obligated to pay ninety two cents of the dollar that you've committed to the fund you're selling your future interests, you know, for eight cents, right? Now, why are you doing that? The reason you're doing that, because if you actually say, we're not going to meet those obligations, then you forfeit the interest in everything you've already owned up to that point, right? So it becomes a mitigation exercise that people were, were engaged in simply to hold on to cash, right? That's what I think generally is missing in the analysis of what happened in 2009 mm. was it was a genuine liquidity crisis. Funds that had thought that they had tons of cash available experienced something similar to me going back to the team at Canyon Partners and saying, okay, I'd like to invest now and saying the money is gone. Mm. If you were a client of Lehman Brothers and you had thought that you had segregated and safe cash, you were actually a client of Lehman Brothers International and that cash disappeared on their filing. Wow. Right. That's really what happened in 2008. It wasn't, you know, home builders defaulting or any of that sort of stuff that really drove it. It's that loss of cash. What I often refer to as the conversion of cash instruments to non-cash instruments. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things I think is so interesting about what's going on right now because we're seeing this. We're seeing the early stages of it, right? the non-traded REITs, the Blackstone REITs, et cetera, suddenly going, okay, you know what? We can't re meet your redemptions, mm. right? Those are signs that cash is becoming non-cash or uh, that cash is becoming non-cash, creating conditions of liquidity, even as a general rebalancing. And I would suggest that we saw the same behavior. 2022, we saw towards the end of the year, a sell-off as people basically tried to maximize their tax losses. Then they reallocated the money back in, in the beginning part of this year. We saw the markets behave very strongly, right? So all, all of this kind of links together into the, in terms of the same sort of behavior. I've just gotten to the point now where I'm, I'm somewhat anesthetized to it. And I'm like, you know, if this is going to happen, it's going to occur. Do I want to position to be directly involved in the trade or do I want to try and take this opportunity to build a longer term position? So once this happens and this starts, can you stop it? Is it stoppable or is it just going to have to play out? Um, it can be stopped if they move fast enough, right? I think that's they been being the a Fed big, or central they being regulators, the Fed, risk takers, et cetera, right? Um, you know, th this cycle is going to be a very interesting one, right? Um, 
there's the classic don't fight the Fed. Obviously, that has been thrown out the window in the past couple of months. Um, as people have generally adopted a liquidity driven model, right? They're looking at the TGA being drawn down as the, the U.S. government tries to avoid uh, a debt ceiling issue. You're looking at the Bank of Japan providing liquidity. You've seen the Bank of England provide some liquidity, et cetera. The Bank of China on the reopening dynamics has actually encouraged credit creation. So people are very focused on the liquidity dynamics. I think the real challenge that I would highlight on this model as it exists right now is all of those are very temporary. China can't continue to print in the way that it did in the 2009 environment. It's a much more uh, constrained, constrained system. Uh, we're already seeing the Bank of Japan be forced to accept and and deal with potentially higher interest rates. Mm -hmm. In the United States, the TGA is eventually going to be drawn down, right? I mean, just so people fully understand what's happening, it's the equivalent of me saying, well, I can't touch my credit lines, so I'm just going to draw down the cash in my checking account, right? Mm -hmm. feels like everything's totally normal, and in economic terms, I'm just not sterilizing the cash that I'm contributing into the economy, behaviorally, that leads people to conclude things must be better. And as prices are going higher, we're seeing the short covering and everything else. This looks a lot like the aftermath of the 2001 terrorist events, right, where you had that very strong rally in the aftermath of it, in which everything basically moved as we headed towards the recession that everybody thought at that point wasn't coming. Those are Mike's first two trades, and it gives you an idea of why he is one of the most respected finance minds around. The final two are just as fantastic. His third involves a win that netted profits of over a billion dollars, but he considers it one of his worst because he didn't fully understand the potential. His fourth trade is an epic tale, complete with a public screaming match, market blow up, and warnings that were ignored. To watch Mike's final two trades and the risks he sees in today's market, join our community at realvision.com.